I'm going to give a, a, a very um, commercial view of, of how big, big um, businesses are thinking about GDP, GDPR. Um, it's hard to um, overstate the transformation that is going on in the commercial world at the moment. I mean, we, we see a lot in, 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 in the press and obviously retailers going bust every week. But um, from the inside, it is an extraordinarily challenging and transformational time. Um, a set of digital technologies um, are effectively transforming customer behavior. So whether businesses like it or not, um, the behavior of customers is, is, is changing so quickly and so radically from where it was five, ten years ago. And particularly from a retailer perspective, um, retail in the past was very, very simple. You found a store format that worked, you opened lots of stores, and stores gave you geographical access to customers. You had a massive advantage because customers only physically had access to your, your stores. And, 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 and literally overnight, that, that model has changed. Um, it's a little bit like a boiling frog, unfortunately, because for the first many, many years, you know, online penetration was still pretty low. But as online penetration has gone up, retailers realize that this model of stores equaling access to customers is broken. And that is changing, changes the fundamentals of retail. It changes the economics of retail. In particular, retail goes from being a fixed cost business to suddenly you've got all these variable costs, marketing costs per click, per transaction. And all of these things spew out masses of data, which is causing businesses to go through, for me, something I'm calling decision re-engineering, very similar to sort of business process re-engineering of 25, 30 years ago. Now businesses need to re-engineer decisions at a very, very fundamental level. So for retailers, their existence is being threatened. Um, if you're a hotel chain, um, uh, if you're a bank, a financial services business, your channels to market are being completely transformed. Um, and if you're a telco, um, you risk being essentially turned into a dumb pipe by, by all these over-the-air apps. But fundamentally, wherever you sit in here, your business is, is, is under mortal threat. Um, so this, this, is, this sort of brings it to life um, for, for what, what, what life looks like for, for a retailer. Um, this is an analysis I, I've, I've done with many, many retailers. And it's a, called a customer decile analysis. I can safely say this in the Turing. We're full of clever people here. Um, what you do here is you take the annual profit of a business, $263 million, um, dollars, and you divide it by 10. You put it into to 10 bins. You can see all these columns, nice, all, all, all same, same numbers. And then you rank customers from most profitable to least profitable. So the thing to notice here is in the top decile, 10,000 customers generate 10% of profit. When you get to the bottom decile, it's taking 377,000 customers to, to, to generate the same profit. And if you look at the average profitability in the top decile, these customers are worth $2,500, and in the bottom decile, they're worth $70. It's a 30x sort of top to bottom decile. This, this picture is the same for every retailer in, in, in the world, and it's often more, more polarizing. Um, stating the obvious, customers are not created equal. And so the point is, if you're a retailer, your, your battle for um, geography it was a, a land grab for land, is now a land grab for high value customers. The battleground for all retailers is around how do we understand our best highest value customers, how do we find, how do we hang on to those, and how do we do what's called whale hunting, which is look for people who look like that in our existing customer base or people who aren't customers yet. Um, Amazon have been at this game for 20 years. Um, you know, my guess is we're all customers of Amazon. Amazon has mapped every single action they take as a business, whether it's downloading an app, whether it's signing up for Prime, whether it's buying into your second, third, fourth category. And Amazon understand the incremental lifetime value of every single one of those actions. You know, what makes them so good is their scale, how clever they are, the fact they've been at this for a long time, and, and this, is, this, this is in the DNA of Amazon and has been in it for a very, very long time. And at the heart, this is a data challenge. So what does this mean? This is now what's going on today. Um, this, is, I, I, this is a screen grab from the ASOS privacy policy, um, but it could, could as much be any, any retailer. And, and this is what retailers are saying on their websites, and, and this is what they mean. Um, ICO is very big on transparency, and this is very transparent. They say, look, we're, we're tracking your purchase history to ensure we're giving you what you want and to stay ahead of the competition. Sounds, sounds benign. 
you know, what is actually going on here, this isn't what ASOS say, but this is what everyone is saying, is, you know, they are trying to model people's profit with an inch of their life. Um, they're chasing you around the web. We're all familiar now with how you get chased around the web wherever you go with ever more enticing offers for things that have sold out. Um, and, 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 and how can we identify look-alike customers? How can we profile you and find people who look like you and look like our highest value customers? Um, there's more. This is, um, this is, again, this is a piece of analysis that ASOS put into the public domain, a piece of work that they did with Imperial College, um, which was modeling customer lifetime value. And, and they, 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 they put out a list of the top data features that were most important in driving um, customer lifetime value. Everything from you know, the number of sessions in the last quarter, the days between the first and last browse session, the age of the customer, number of products viewed, blah, 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 blah. Deep, deep, deep analysis on, on essentially mining all the data features that they can get their mitts onto to actually understand what drives customer profitability. Because this is simply a battle, the, the, the battle for retail and then played out in other, other industries is a battle for customers. So the question is, who actually cares? Um, when you, you, you look at the um, you know, ontology of customers out there, um, th there's sort of three groups that are typically talked about. Um, you know, the, the people who truly are unconcerned, they just re recognize this is how the world works, um, the pragmatists, um, and, 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 and a, a small but very vocal group of fundamentalists. It is, it, I, I clearly not, it is clearly not the case that nobody cares, but I can tell you from all of my experience that the number of people who actually care is very, very small. Um, when you talk about the well-meaning cookie regulation, the former Data Protection Act, um, which has simply led to billions of unnecessary clicks every day to get this annoying pop-up to go away. Um, now, I, I preside over the web analytics of about 35 different businesses, so I see everything that is looked at by every, every customer. And I can tell you the About Cookies page is the least viewed page on every single website <laughs> I visit. Nobody cares. And, and when you do visit those pages, as I do, and I, 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 I looked at the John Lewis um, About Cookies page last night, and I'm pretty technical, and I have absolutely no idea what these cookies are doing. I mean, they're putting about 57 cookies on my computer of businesses I've never heard of. I trust them. They seem like nice people. But you know, the, the idea that this is somehow educating consumers um, in a useful way, it was well-meaning, but the consequences, unfortunately, do not deliver on that. So I think it's really important to understand you know, who actually really um, genuinely cares. And again, you get the sense of you know, consumers like all this free stuff they're getting access to, free apps and all these promotions. Most people don't want to know what's in the sausage, what goes into the sausage. Um, and I think the risk is we design something for a very small minority that, that the majority are, are, are genuinely um, don't care so much about. Um, one of the things in the um, GDPR, now moving on to GDPR, I've seen is a real explosion in the quality of infographics. I've been, I've been <laughs> delighted <coughs> by, I mean, really some of the finest infographics since maybe since Brexit. And this is, this is one from, from the ICO, which, again, you know, it's the law. Let's, we need to get over that. And in many ways, it's a sensible law. I mean, when you talk to, when you talk to the ICO, I've spent a bunch of time with the ICO, and, and I think one of their observations is not much in this is new. This is all stuff that businesses should have been doing. It isn't, it isn't transformation. It's kind of embarrassing that for the first time, retailers are having to do all this stuff. Um, so this shouldn't be sort of so over. Well, I mean, it all seems you know, pretty sensible and straightforward at, at, at face value. Building on the on previous um, speaker's comments, I think the key for me is all around the uncertainty. And there are lots of uncertainties, and there are lots of different flavors of uncertainties. I'll start, start off with, with even the legal, the legal framework. Um, you know, again, um, and I'm not a lawyer, um, but you know, PECA was going to, the new PECA was going to come in by, by 2018. It now isn't. Some people say it's going to be 2019. Some people say it's 2020. How the exactly PECA and GDPR, or the new Data Protection Act, will, will play together, um, you know, no one is quite sure about. So there's certainly a legal framework um, r r r risk here. 
Um, there's a bunch of things around how the law is actually going to be interpreted in practice. And I'll come on a little bit later to particularly around legitimate interest versus consent and, and how, where legitimate interest will begin, and, will begin and end. There's a lot of uncertainty around customer behavior. So obviously the various rights to erasure or the right to be forgotten or right to see your information about you, you know, is that going to be, and of course there are similar-ish rights today, if the volumes stay at the same level, that's fine. If the volumes are hundreds or thousands a month, then the world has a big, big problem. And so, you know, that's hugely uncertain for businesses trying to work out, do they try and do this manually or do they try and build systems to cope with it? Um, then there's a question of enforcement. You know, obviously the, 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 the rights, what will be, well, we've looked at what you're doing, we'd really like you to stop doing it versus actually we're going to um, really tell you to stop doing it versus um, we're going to fine you. And then what will the fines be? When, when you look and I've analysed the existing ICO fines, where when people have done really, really dumb things, they're not really, frankly, fined a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but there are a lot of businesses out there that could now be fined hundreds of millions, if not billions. Um, so, you know, and again, you know, again, the ICO have been talking about, well, we're going to be proportionate, but the fact is that the highest possible fines are eye-watering. Um, and so you have lots and lots of uncertainty. And, and as we said before, uncertainty, uh, well, actually, let's, let's, let's focus on, on actually a bit, bit more on the uncertainty. The, 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 the most basic thing that retailers want to do if I, the, 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 around marketing is they want to capture data about customers and they want to communicate with them. It's really business as usual. And what happens today is you, you, you capture data. It's like what ASOS is doing. You're capturing customer data, you're profiling customers, you're acting under a soft opt-in that means if a customer has transacted with you, I can email them. That's perfectly reasonable with a, with a one-click um, one opt-out. And I can personalize emails based on what you viewed and what, what you've been interested in. It is business as usual. It's how the commercial world works. And understanding exactly under a GDPR and PECA today, PECA in future, how that will work, to be blunt, is a bugger's muddle. Now, I have done a lot of search on this. And, and, and one of the businesses I work with, we asked for a legal opinion from one of the big law firms, and we got 40 pages. I mean, hate to think how much, I mean, you know, come right back to that. But, but the, the lack of clarity on is this going to be OK or not OK? Um, what do similar goods and services mean? You know, if, if, you've, if you've bought a, you know, if you've bought a chicken, you know, can I, can I try and cross sell you a barbecue? And again, pages and pages of debates of how similar goods and services. I mean, when my comments are, I can't believe the ICO really cares about this, but unfortunately, while the uncertainty remains, people say, well, we could be fined up to, you know, 700 million pounds, you know, and, and that's the problem. You know, I have really, the only people who, who, for me, like uncertainty are statisticians and lawyers. This is the not seen lawyers so excited for a very, very long time. <laughs> so what does uncertainty turn into? Well, uncertainty turns into risk. So if anybody who sits on any, any, any board, this is what you get used to staring at, which is a risk framework. Um, and how do you think about this? So when I, when I, when I sit on my boards, you know, they then, they then put risks on here, and GDPR is somewhere on here, and cyber. Cyber is always, you know, low, low likelihood, massive impact if it happens. And the problem with GDPR is because you've got potentially this, this you know, 4% of global turnover as the worst possible outcome, the, the impact if something goes wrong is really, really horrible. So even very unlikely things multiplied by a, a, a potential multiple hundreds of millions of outcome leads to very, very dysfunctional behavior. And that really is my concern, that the, the risk-adjusted behaviors leads businesses into a bad place. So this is, this is the, the data death spiral that I am seeing, which is, you know, there's this battle for customers going on but regulatory uncertainty leads to, to risk. That risk goes in two directions then. Retailers start saying, well, actually, or businesses, we just better, it's just safer, let's ask for consent, which then decimates um, the customer base. One thing I was meant to talk to earlier is the, 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 the privacy paradox, which many of you will be aware of. But where we've done research, if you ask customers up front, you know, tick, do you, do you, do you accept all these terms and conditions? 80% of customers say no. 
And if you ask them a year later, were you happy with what Retailer X did with your data? Did you like the promotions, the communications? 80% will say, oh, it was fantastic. And that is the problem. If you ask for consent up front, before customers have understood the value of what you're giving them, you get massive opt-out rates and you decimate your customer base. Or you minimize your data capture, but the consequence of that is you get increasingly uncompetitive. And you get increasingly uncompetitive in a world that's increasingly competitive. And the problem is, um, I'll cut Facebook out because it's a little bit sensitive at the moment, but you know, the guys we're competing against, and, and, and you know, these people have a frequency of interaction with customers, which basically means they ask customers, will you consent to this? Customers will say yes, because the web relies on you using these four, four players. Um, they have the commercial mouse, and they are simply so aggressively commercial that they think they can get away with everything. You know, when you talk to people at these businesses, they see it as business as usual. They're not going to change a thing. So that is really all I had to say. I'm going to summarize with my, my wish list, which is how do we get rid of the uncertainty, ASAP? Um, how do we minimize the paranoia? Because again, that's unhealthy. And, and create an environment for rational discussion. Because again, all the businesses I work with, none of them want to talk to the ICO because they're all risk, they're all scared of being picked on. So there is a real, um, a real hazard going on here that, that nobody wants to put their head above the parapet to say, this is a bit scary. Thank you.